Okay, uh, I think we can get started. Uh, I have the pleasure to uh, moderate this first session on genetics. You know the ground rules. The first speaker, Anne Bocart, is going to have 10 minutes, uh, followed by Judy Cho. Every and being the newest member, has been given more time. The rest of the people are known to us. It will be given five minutes. Uh, questions will follow, uh, and we must stay on time. Again, we have, in fact, lights here. Well, it's green, you can speak. When it goes yellow, you have one minute left. And I understand when it goes red, the hook comes out. <laughs> and you can no longer speak. Uh, so let, I just want to say a few words, I think, again. Uh, what we've heard from Adam is obviously an exciting vision to bring us all together. Certainly in my experience, and I've spent time at many uh, medical centers, I, I really feel that Mount Sinai is the most exciting place to be at. It's a place that really uh, holds in high esteem team science and translational research. Its effort really is to bring together many disciplines. Uh, and there's an energy that it has, which I think is infectious. I really think in many ways that came with the uh, recruitment of, of Dennis Chani uh, and his enthusiasm and commitment and his demands of excellence, I think really fosters this whole center I think something Dennis said, I really hits home. So having been an immunologist for many, many years, the field of immunotherapy is really exciting. But to some extent, we have to step back and be quite humble about what we haven't done yet. So in fact, Dennis's point about an aunt who died of lung cancer was we know about Pam Sklar dying of uh, metastatic breast cancer. So we've become a little bit, I would say, certainly immunologists, somewhat arrogant about the extraordinary responses that we are seeing using immunotherapy, very much of it fostered on the genetics that we'll hear about. And so if we see 30%, what we might say, long-term responses to lung cancer, long-term is three to five years, not 25 years, and we've sometimes Focus on that and forget about the 65% that are not responding. So our charge really is that. You know, it's to build on this modest success that we've had, modest success, which has given us some of the tools to do much, much better. So in fact, I think we really have to be humble about our successes. I think they've given us a roadmap, especially in the field of immunotherapy and in its interaction with genetics. But we have a long way to go. And if we don't improve upon you know, those responses, the length of remissions, uh, our next decade, is, we will be failures to society. So we have to be humble. We have to work extraordinarily hard. I think we have to work in a teamwork setting. And that really is essential. And I think if we do that, we're going to make extraordinary contributions to humankind. Uh, that when you look back on your life as I've been at this a while, you can feel quite proud of what you've contributed to society. And it's what Dennis said, this is what it's all about. The impact you have on humankind is really what we're responsible for. We've been given the tools, you know, in some ways, you know, we get money from philanthropy, and I, but we're on the dole. Nobody here is really working. You're given money to do a bunch of experiments. You're not digging ditches. You're not driving trucks. You're sitting on your butt and doing experiments. So you have a responsibility to work your butt off. You know, you get to sleep at night most of the time. So really be responsible and make a contribution and change the outcome of mankind. And if you don't, you have wasted your life and you've wasted a lot of money. So. Uh, that's my imploring upon you. So let's start with something more. Ann Bocock. Ann comes to us. She had been at Wash U for a number of years. She had then gone to England and decided the United States was a much more <laughs> supportive place. Ann has made contributions in multiple areas in 
the understanding of psoriasis, also of melanoma, <coughs> especially in the area of uveal melanoma, a really bad disease. I mean, it's relatively rare, so Anne, take it away. Thank you very much. So I'm going to tell you about uveal melanoma, which is the most common eye cancer in adults, and it accounts for 70% uh, of all eye malignancies and represents 5% of all melanomas. It has an incidence of five to 10 per million, and risk factors include age, light skin, and blue eyes. Unlike cutaneous melanoma, there's no link with UV. Most worryingly, 50% of uveal melanoma patients are diagnosed with metastases, which usually occurs to the liver. There are no effective treatments, even the recently developed immunotherapies don't work, and after this, the median survival time is six months. So there's an urgent need to understand and predict both tumorigenesis and metastasis. So for a number of years, we and others have used molecular approaches to identify molecular drivers and to identify the altered transcriptomes and epigenomes of uveal melanoma. And it turns out that about 90% of uveal melanovas have mutations in um, one of two oncogenes, termed GNAQ or GNA11. These are activating mutations. So these genes encode the G protein alpha subunits, and mutations activate the MAP kinase pathway. However, these mutations are early or initiating events, and they're not correlated with metastasis. In contrast, if you profile the transcriptomes of tumors, they separate into two groups. As you see in the principal component graph on, this, on the right, where non-metastasizing tumors are shown in blue and metastasizing tumors are sh shown in red. So the blue tumors um, we call class one and the red we call class two with high metastatic risk. The survival curves of individuals with these two tumor types are also shown on the right with the y-axis corresponding to percent metastasis free a proportion of individuals that are metastasis free. And you can see that it's much, much higher out at 50 months for class one versus class two, where only less than 20% are metastasis free. So this observation has now been translated into a routine clinical test, which is done during initial treatment. It only requires an analysis of 15 genes, and it's looking at the transcript levels of these genes. And as you can see on the heat map on the right, this is to sufficient to separate the class two from the class one tumors. Now it turns out that highly metastatic class two tumors have only a single copy of chromosome three, so they're monosomy three, and in contrast, class one tumors are disomy three, so you know, the normal two copies. So this observation led us to hypothesize that chromosome three harbors a metastasis suppressor of uveal melanoma. And in 2010, using the newly developed exome sequencing technologies, we identified this metastasis suppressor as BAP1. And we showed that 84% of class two metastasizing uveal melanomas had deleterious mutations in this gene. And this slide shows the organization of BAP1 with exons, exons as the um, blue squares, and then conserved domains shown in the um, orange um, boxes. The different types of mutations we identified are shown below the figure, and they comprised a variety of loss of function mutations, including indels and nonsense mutations. Missense mutations generally clustered in the UCH or ubiquitin carboxy terminal hydrolase domain. And this provided insights into the altered function of BAP1 during tumorigenesis and metastasis, since BAP1 is an 80 kilodalton nuclear protein and a deubiquitinase and member of the polycomb complex, which pay, plays a role in gene silencing. So we showed that in cell lines, loss of function or in loss of BAP1 leads to reversion to a stem cell-like state. And at the molecular level, this is accompanied by failure to deubiquinate its targets and specifically histone H2A. This leads to closed histones and cells which resemble class II tumors. In the presence of wild-type BAP, H2A can be deubiquitinated 
and histones are open so that cells look like those from class I tumors. Histone deacetylase inhibitors can revert the effects of loss of BAP1, and it, it's important to find other drugs that can do the same thing and target this altered pathway. We've also investigated the molecular basis of other tumors and identified mutations in genes encoding a splicing factor, termed SF3B1, in 30% of class I uveal melanomas. Mutations generally affect a single residue, arginine, shown here, arginine 625, and they're thought to actually generate change of function alterations that affect splicing. And these affect splicing of a number of target genes. This can lead to loss of the transcript through aberrant splicing and nonsense-mediated decay. However, the actual targets leading to uveal melanoma are poorly understood, which is something we're also looking at. So this slide summarizes the distribution of GNAQ, GNA11, BAP1, and SF3B1 mutations in the class one and class two uveal melanomas each of which are shown at the top of each chart. As you can see, GNAQ and GNA11 mutations, shown in green, are mutually exclusive and are found at similar frequencies in the two tumor types. However, BAT1 mutations, shown in red, are found almost predominantly in the class II highly metastatic tumors. And SF3B1 mutations are found nearly always in the less metastatic class I tumors. But you can also see that there's some class II tumors that have no known driver, and we're actually looking. We, we believe we have a second one now, but it's been very hard to find these additional um, drivers. And the same is true with the class I tumors. We've now completed exome sequencing of additional tumors. And after incorporating data from TCGA, the landscape of 139 primary uveal melanomas is shown on this slide. So here are the tumors, and you can see that BAP1, the, the genes are shown down here. BAP1 comprises the predominant type of mutation in metastasizing tumors. And then we also have SF3B1 here. And the only other gene that comes up more commonly than anything else in the remainder is EIF1AX, which turns out to be a translation factor. So how a deubiquitinase, a splicing factor, and a translation factor, all, when altered, can lead to tumors of the same type of um, cell is something we really need to understand, and it's, it's very difficult. And this will require integration of large number of different data sets that you just heard Adam um, talk about. So the other thing that um, you can note on this slide is copy number change. Now, here we have gain of chromosome 8Q in a large number of tumors and um, loss of 6Q in a subset. So we're very interested in um, how these uh, copy number changes contribute to tumorigenesis, and this is something else we're working on. Um, so I just want to summarize what, we've, uh, what I've told you about the progression of uveal melanomas. So following activation of oncogenic mutations in genes such as GNAQ or GNA11, a nevus arises in the eye. Additional changes, such as loss of chromosome 3 and BAT1 mutations, lead to the development of class 2 tumors in that order, interestingly, and then metastasis within a median time of 33 months. Other mutations, such as those in genes such as SF3B1 and EIF1AX, leads to class I tumors. Now, class I tumors can actually be divided into two types, non-metastasizing and slow-metastasizing tumors. And we now know that these slow-metastasizing tumors are also associated with upregulation of a gene called PREM and uh, also loss of chromosome 6Q, which is also something that we are continuing to examine. Um, this leads to metastasis at a median time of um, 88 months in 20% of tumors. So um, that's what we know about uveal melanoma. Uh, there's a lot of work to be done, um, and hopefully novel drugs for this very hard to treat cancer. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge my collaborative group, Bill Harbour, who's been a major collaborator, um, my group at Washington University in St. Louis and in, at Imperial College, and um, Aaron Singh at Cleveland Clinic and funding as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>